I'm a sculptor. My name is Amin Lamontagne. I've done many American heroes and heroines. Armand has really written a new chapter in wood carving and wood sculpting. You might argue about the subject, but you can't argue about the work. In some ways, he doesn't fit in because he's in a class by himself. Ladies and gentlemen, Armand Lamontagne's Larry Bird. You know, the only thing about Armand. It was all right from the head down to the waist, but when he started beating around with that chisel and hammer down there a little bit lower, I could feel it at night, so. <laughs> I think it's the greatest hoax. The experts were fooled so badly. Armin never really set out to fool anybody. The experts ended up fooling themselves. When I was like a little kid, you know, with my eyes bucking out of my head, watching all these pictures of these, whether it was the house building or the sculptures or the paintings. The one thing about Armin's houses, uh, they were pretty authentic. They are homes that are probably some of the most prominent reproductions of colonial homes in New England. To recreate a living human being is really remarkable. Armin Lamontagne is the best wood portrait sculptor in the world, period. But certainly given what he has done with wood, he has certainly transformed wood sculpture into an art form. Who the hell is doing this? Michelangelo? He refers to himself as a caveman, but others have known him as an artist, craftsman, gardener, landscaper, furniture maker, timber framer, house builder, wood carver, and at one time as an accomplished athlete. His passion for athletics and his artistic talent have combined to make him the foremost sculptor of athletes and American heroes alive today. His works are housed in some of the most prestigious museums and institutions in the country. He is a seemingly tireless dynamo who has personally created almost everything within his domain, including the house he lives in and most of its furnishings. Armand Lamontagne is a 21st century Renaissance man. In 1938, Armand Lamontagne was born in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, a quiet, medium-sized city that had once been known for its thriving cotton mills. The Lamontagnes were a family of architects, woodworkers, and craftsmen. Both families involved in construction, both on my mother's side and my father's side, so uh, perhaps that's why I've uh, I've gone into uh, creating things or building things either out of wood or stone. And my father was a general superintendent, ran big jobs, and uh, he was a very competent person. But he did it the hard way. Uh, with not much education, rose very high. In other words, he, he, was, he was like an engineer, uh, although he didn't have a degree. When you're a general superintendent of you know, industrial construction, you've got to know an awful lot about an awful lot of things. Competing with seven siblings for his parents' attention, Armand soon showed himself to be a curious and inquisitive child. At a very early age, his favorite pastimes were playing with his father's tools, carving. His grandfather was an architect, so he must have been familiar with wood use and buildings from the earliest age. Uh, he told me that when he was five, six, seven years old, he would be in his uh, grandfather's studio uh, playing around on the drafting boards, perhaps scratching them up. I would proceed to break every sharp pencil he had in his, uh, he had a can and with all a bunch of sharp pencils. And my father used to get upset because I remember, uh, one of the vivid things I remember is, you know, he said, don't break the pencil. So my grandfather said, no, let him alone. He says, he can only break them once. And when he, when he leaves, he says, I'll sharpen them. Growing up, right after the Second World War, cap guns were a big thing and I was just a youngster and my, we couldn't afford cap guns. My dad carved his own out of wood and uh, the, the, the little fella across the street or whatever, the, the little neighbor, he, he, uh, you know, he said, oh, I'll, I'll take that wooden one, I'll, I'll trade you, you know, and they, they traded and, and uh, you know, they were both happy. It was a mutual agreement, so. Armin's carving and drawing continued to develop and by his teen years, another talent became obvious. An affinity for sports blossomed and at Pawtucket Vocational Technical High School, he was destined for stardom in three different sports. No question, he was a, an outstanding athlete. And it, it began at a very, very early age. 
Uh, in his freshman year of high school, um, he made the all-star team as a pitcher. And he pitched one inning and he struck out every guy he faced. The first pitch he threw went up the backstop. And I think he did it on purpose. And I guess the guy was a little afraid because he could really fire the ball. And that was the only ball he threw in that inning. Armin was a pitcher in the early days in high school, but he was such a great hitter that he started playing first base and he did a little less and less pitching. And he had a 400 average for four years in high school. And one visiting coach, I can't remember his name, but he was from Burrowville High School, he said, if you let that guy beat you, you'll never pitch again. So great as he was, it was very difficult to hit 400 because he never got very good pitches to hit. He was also outstanding in three sports, baseball, basketball, and football. And he made all state in both football and baseball. Armin's artistic skill equaled his athletic prowess, and his talents were soon applied to his high school senior class yearbook. I was a junior then, but the senior class didn't have any, anybody to do the artwork, so I was recruited. I look back on that and I, I see how crude some of the things were, but you know, I guess that's how you know you've improved when you, when you go back and say, geez, I'm, I'm so glad I didn't stay in that area. I got better at sports, and as time went on towards my junior and senior year, I was having offers of you know, scholarships to go to different schools. I haven't been such a great athlete at an early age, and Lefty Buffet, who was a, a scout at the time, believed that he would have been an outstanding professional player. He even sent him to Worcester Academy. I think it was the fall of 1957. Uh, Lefty Lefebvre, a great player at Holy Cross, brought Armin up here from Rhode Island, and uh, he was to start school with us in that fall. I tell you, he started in all three sports. And in basketball, he was a terrific rebounder. He played up front, which was a big guy at that point in time. And a fine pitcher, fine first baseman, hit with power, good strong arm. He played football here as an outstanding fullback on a team that lost only one ball game. He was a big, strong, silent, proud, outstanding competitor, a deep kid, uh, very refined. Armin went to BC to play for Mike Hollaback apparently was not as thrilled with football as he might have thought he should have been, would have been, could have been, and apparently it, it wasn't going as well as he might have hoped. What I really wanted to play is baseball, and I could have, had they given out baseball scholarships. They didn't. He played two years of football, and unfortunately he didn't play his best sport, and that was baseball. And I really believe, had he played in college, he would have been in the major leagues. He would have been a good player but he wouldn't have been the greatest player. But he is the greatest at what he does in, in art as a sculptor and painter. I don't know that I've ever had any other athlete quite like this. You've seen them go into medicine, clergy, military, coaching, uh, banking, uh, become executives and corporate leaders, professional athletes but never with this gift. And it's special and he's special. William Rush was the first American sculptor. He happened to be a wood sculptor and he happened to do figureheads. And all I'm doing and the fact that I'm interested in this is that I'm just continuing a tradition that was well established in this country. But I'm not concerned about carving, I'm concerned about expression, getting a good feeling. I know how to carve, I think, uh, to this point. So now I'm carving for interpretation rather than just to carve. So the important thing is, the big thing is something that's not there. It's a spiritual thing. It's, a, it's, it's something you can't put your finger on and quite elusive. In essence, hard to explain. When I get it, I know it. And when I don't get it, I know it. That's about as accurate as I can get. Along with his success as an athlete at Boston College, LaMontagne continued to pursue his artistic interests. Wood carving and portrait painting remained prime pursuits, and he created artwork for the BC newspaper Coming to the inevitable conclusion that his professional future would lie in the world of art, he decided to leave B.C. after two years. I went in the Army. In those days, you had to do, you had to do your Army time, whether it was two years or six months. 
Active duty, and that, that's what I did. In 1961, after meeting his military obligations in the United States Army, Armin joined the Rhode Island State Police to supplement his income from his work as an artist and sculptor. He came out of the Army, you know, he said, well, what do you do now? And, and, and a friend of mine says, you know, the State Police have an opening, blah, blah, blah. so I wasn't really interested in it. He had actually no, hadn't planned to go for it. He actually went with a friend because the friend was interested in joining and talked him into applying also and he got in and the friend didn't. <laughs> I was single, it was a job, I wasn't particularly crazy about it and that's why I lasted less than a year and I, and I ended up getting married. Lorraine Robitel was a high school acquaintance of Armin's. They had remained friends through his years in Worcester and Boston. Their long friendship blossomed after Armand returned to Rhode Island and Lorraine responded positively when Armand popped the question. In the back of my mind, I had a certain type of person I was expecting to meet and he fit the bill as far as I was concerned. I liked his attitude about everything in life and he was a serious person and I liked that. I think my sister introduced to my, uh, my, my future wife way back in high school uh, and I've never I've always had that against her uh, but uh, no I, I think it's been a great thing uh, well I mean we're still together after I don't know it's 30 some years I can't really tell you the exact year I'll have to look it up but I can't ask my wife for that. Armin's artistic talents were now getting some recognition he was awarded a grant to study sculpture in Europe it was a trip that would forever alter the course of his life at that point, I received the Russell Grinnell Foundation grant and to study in Europe, and I said, well, let me do two things at once. Let me get married, take my honeymoon, and go, and, and go to Europe on my honeymoon and study in Florence, Italy. Naturally, he didn't want to go alone, <laughs> which I was grateful for, because that would have been a year away. Um, so he asked if I could go along with them. We went on the Queen Mary uh, to Europe. great experience, uh, the traveling, the education, just seeing Europe as a young person, all the architecture and, and the, different, the different lifestyles was a tremendous education. You know, seeing where the Renaissance was created, right there in Florence, what a great place for a sculptor. Nothing more magnificent than the stones of Italy, especially Florence, the Medici's and the, that, that, all those museums in Florence, wonderful place. Wonderful ambiance for, for a young person who wants to be an artist. I could think of a better place. In Florence, Armand apprenticed to an art studio and an Italian master sculptor named Berti. He was a sculptor who had worked in France most of his life on monuments as a professional. And you know, you learn from people who do it for a living. He had a little studio, an 800-year-old studio, which is, he said that was new in Florence. His teacher seemed to think that he had a lot of ability to shape things whether it's wood or stone or whatever, he just had the, the eye could see it inside the, the piece that he was working on. Right at the end of the corridor of the Academy of Fine Arts in Florence is the famous David. It's inside, it's in, there's a little dome over it, and magnificent, 26 feet high, and every so often I'd walk down, take a good look at it. Along the wall, the six unfinished Michelangelo's, about half done, quarter done, whatever. They call the unfinished pieces. It took me a long time to realize one day it was a great awakening that one day I walked down and I said, why didn't he finish these pieces? That thought occurred to me. Because I used to study those a lot more than a David. David's all done. These were a work in progress. And I was concerned with the mechanics, uh, the technical stuff, the point, what angle, I, you know, what kind of a roughing that he did, what, what kind of an intermediate tool, and what kind of finish. And it was all there in these unfinished pieces. It dawned on me, these are all, he messed them up. And God knows the Italians would never tell you that Michelangelo messed up. They're mistakes. And he realized it. And the reason they're mistakes is because he did the wrong things. He was impatient, which I could relate to. You want know, to finish one area uh, more than another when you're supposed to kind of work the whole thing and not just one area. And you can see where he 
like he was running out of marble to the top of this guy's head. One of the slaves, and because he stopped, he realized, you know, why go any further? Uh, there's a great strength of the things. I mean, I love these unfinished pieces, perhaps even more than the David. There's an enormous amount of power, and you can see the freshness with which he attacked the block. He took a lot of chances because he pointed, he, he pointed the chisel straight in, and there's a chance that you could split the whole block, but you can get the rough off fast. Which meant to me that he was impatient, had a lot to do. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, the day I found out that Michelangelo was human, had two hands like me, uh, was a great day. He often talks about his visits to Florence almost 35 years ago, pointing out that he walked the very streets that da Vinci and Michelangelo walked. And I often wondered how he related to those people. And if he asked himself, can I become as great as they were? What will it take? And he found his medium of wood, and I truly believe he has uh, reached their high standards of excellence and greatness. Whomever gave him that grant started him on a brilliant career. It takes many trifles to make a masterpiece, but a masterpiece is no trifle. In 1964, the La Montaigne's returned from Florence. Secure in his preference for wood over any other medium, Armand soon began setting up shop. Some of his early, less than glamorous assignments consisted of creating furniture, carving signs, and sculpting figurines. Lorraine contributed to their income by working as a secretary, but there was always this one certain project in the back of his mind that Armand was itching to get started on. I knew what I wanted to do. The rude awakening was that, that I'd have to do it. You, you, know, you can't rely on a degree. Uh, I'm not teaching, and I didn't want to teach. Teaching is a whole other profession. Uh, and there's, of course, nothing against that, but I wanted to do things. We came back in 64, and we were back about a couple, two, three months, and he decided he wanted to build the Gambrel. I said, well, look, I have to build a house, I have to build a studio. And so a caveman always has, to, you know, that's caveman thinking. You have to have, that's fundamentals. You have to have a place to stay and work. And, and uh, so I had to build my cave, uh, which is why I built my first house. I started doing research on American, early American houses. And, and uh, that's how that evolved, I guess. I wanted to restore an early period house, but I couldn't get it where I wanted it, and, and I couldn't afford it. So I had to convert what I had, which is youth and energy, and, and uh, to something I didn't have, which is money. I reproduced, you know, there was the post and beam house. And I did the research, which in essence was built, all made by hand out of wood and stone, which is a sculpture. It's a practical sculpture that you live in. Once I built one, again, it, it, things evolved. And I wasn't really happy with the first one because, you know, you make all your mistakes on the first one. So I had a chance to sell my first one because it was so unique and so I had a chance to sell my mistakes. And whenever you can do that, you do it. And I made a little profit and built another one, which with all the new improvements and all the way I really wanted to do it. And in a way, I could afford to do what I wanted to do on the second one, which is what I did. And of course, now you, now you develop a theory or, a, or a, a plan that, Jesus, if it worked the first time, maybe it'll work even better the second or third time. And that's what happened. I first met Armin in uh, 1971 when my wife and I uh, bought his home in North Situate, one of the uh, four early American homes that he built up there. The one thing about Armin's houses, uh, they were pretty authentic. They were all post and beam. They were absolutely like originals. They are homes that to this day are probably some of the most prominent reproductions of colonial homes in New England. Armin uh, researched those houses and the architectural development of early American homes. The materials that uh, Armin used in those houses were all native, primarily Rhode Island materials. The oak post and beams, the materials for the masonry, the, the stonework, the fireplaces. And each house that he had built was definitely researched for authenticity. It was a great experience. I learned a great deal. Remember now, what I was doing is post and beam, all hand hewn, mortise and tenon, and I was doing the stone chimneys, which again, stone natural materials, 
and I was moving south one house at a time. He did it all. I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was a process uh, that took several years to build that home. Armin being the visionary that he was, he built this tremendous stone wall by himself that took literally one summer. And it was approximately 27 inches at the top and 50 inches at the base, and it was just perfect wall. And now as you go by, it's a set wall now, and uh, some people recognize a wall expert as being an authentic wall. It was just an article that was just written about that wall, New England stone walls. As far as the house went, he virtually did, except for the mechanical and the plumbing, he did that house himself with uh, very little help. He's done about a dozen period houses, uh, his stone under being his last. He really compares this to a kind of 17th century uh, medieval fortress. He loves the combination of wood and stone, his two favorite uh, mediums. He's a man, though, who I think is as comfortable uh, living in an environment of a different world as he is living in the world now. His home, again, is a place that uh, if you didn't know and if you weren't really up on things, you would swear he lived in a home that was over 300 years old. Ten years ago when I met him, 12 years ago, I didn't know. I don't even know if I knew what a timber frame was. And so he's brought me from teaching me about him now to, to owning one. Because this house and all these other houses that he built are, well, he calls them his, his greatest sculpture. Now, once you have the house done and built and you have to now furnish it with period furniture. So now you have to do research and design. So that's how things evolve. After a while, you get to be pretty good with furniture. And this is how the great Brewster chair story ends up. I didn't sit down and plan this. I was at the Hartford Athenaeum. I was helping my lifelong friend, Ray McKeon. Furniture was a keen interest, and Ray was going to have to furnish his house. So let's take a ride to Hartford, see the Athenaeum, and to see the famous Wallace Nutting Collection. Armand and a friend of his in the uh, late 60s were taking a tour of the museum, and Armand, being as critical as he is, was commenting on, on the collection. Um, pointing out perhaps that, well, this is not the best example of Puritan furniture, or this is not the best example of William and Mary style. Uh, oh, look at the repair on, on that piece. What a poor job was done. Well, it so happened that the curator was there at the time and overheard him saying these things. And apparently the acoustics were wonderful, and he could hear every word we said, and I guess it just got to him. And he was probably learning things that he didn't know about his own pieces. Now this is Pilgrim stuff, and Ray and I could not believe that this wasn't restored better than, than it was. And in other words, we could do, we, we would do a better job if we had to do this. The curator came and told Armand that he was absolutely incorrect, and would he please leave the museum. So on the way back, a thought occurred to me. I said, you know, these guys can be fooled. Now I often think this is a story of, um, of getting even rather than getting mad. And so he decided on something to fool these so-called experts. And he probably gave it a great deal of thought, um, wondering now what could he do? Could he uh, come up with a piece of furniture that he had made and claim that it was, um, well, much older than it really was? I didn't say too much. I kept thinking about it. And I said, Ray, there's going to be a great Brewster chair. There's only two others known. I'm going to find that great Brewster chair. When I did this chair, I started to do it. I wanted to do it pretty much the way it would have been done originally. I knew how they did it. I just, I just had never done it quite the same way. For instance, you start by chopping a tree down, a white ash. From that, I took the quarters, re-split the quarters into squares for the four main posts all the other smaller stuff, again out of ash, split those for turning later. Uh, in other words, this is exactly how it was done, except that when I used the lathe, I used a motor-driven lathe. What I did is just slow the lathe down to get the same effect. The more I got involved with it, the more fascinated I was with it, the, the story behind everything. What I always found fascinating about the story, being a woodworker, is how he gave this chair a physical history because 
he must have asked himself, what really happens to a chair over three and a half centuries? It will undergo a great deal of wear, and this is what he did. Aging is like creating a painting. It's a certain look that time does to things. And that's what aging is. Obviously, what I had to do is artificially do it. It's something that has to be experimented with. And believe me, I did a great deal of experimentation. He decided how to distress it, putting dust into the cracks. He came up with such things as deciding that somewhere over the three and a half centuries, a little boy must have sat in the chair and perhaps taken a penknife and whittled at it. And this is the genius of the man to ask the questions that really nobody else would have asked. The tank is still out in the back where he smoked the chair. You know, he smoked it for, I don't know, a week or so. Uh, steamed it. You know, it's five dowels. And like if you put your feet up there, you would have kicked the dowels out if you were a kid. And so he kept two of those dowels. And then he kept the cuttings off of the bottom of the chair after it was on the lady. So that acted as a fingerprint if they had any doubt whether that was the right chair or not. And he made it exactly like the genuine ones, but he did something different. He implanted a penny under the underside of the chair. He decided to do something um, very uh, clever. He planted this chair in a small antique shop on an island off the coast of Maine. I said, take this, put it in your big Victorian house. He was a kind of a junk dealer. He wasn't a, a real, ant he was like a picker had just enough knowledge to make a profit, didn't really know his stuff. I told him what it was, told him what I was doing. And he said, all right, let me put it in my, in my with all my other junk and just see the react. Because dealers come in trying to steal things from pickers. And it was setting it up. And uh, I said, look, you can't pass it off as old. It's there. Let the buyer assume what it is. And don't sell it for a lot of money. Very, very cheap. And that, again, the key factor. And he did. Well, someone, in quote, unquote, discovered the uh, great Brewster chair, brought it to the mainland, it exchanged hands a few times, and ended up at the Henry Ford Museum as an original, as a chair probably 350 years old, as a chair that would have made it the oldest, the oldest chair in the United States that was not uh, Spanish. The um Ford Museum, they thought that they had an original chair and naturally it wasn't. And he didn't tell them about that uh, for about nine years after he had done the chair. And then after that, it, uh, it showed up, uh, they did a story on it in the Providence Journal and they released it. And then the Ford Museum found out that they had a fake. I went over my story, I showed them my evidence. Well, they ran with that stuff. They won a, the journal won a prize. The magazine Sunday section won a national prize for that story. So it's crazy. I mean, I didn't know this was gonna happen when I was doing this. What people like most is that the experts were had. That here was a man wearing work shoes and work clothes with really no reputation except uh, a maker of houses and fine furniture to suddenly fool the experts to really come out of nowhere and to show that the experts are not always so expert in what they claim to be. There are a lot of people doing antique reproductions or forgeries. You know, one's one thing, one's the other. So he didn't really do it just for the, for the challenge of, of making a, a, a fake antique and seeing how how well he could make one, but he did it for the whole cat and mouse and the chase and the and the battle of battle of egos of it, and uh, and all with his tongue firmly in his cheek. That's what I that's what I enjoy about that story. I had never done a half-size sculpture, and perhaps this is again something that fascinates that gets me excited about doing this particular one. I've got him pretty much in a, in a stand-up pose where his body is relaxed, but his head and his emotion and his frame of mind, uh, his state of mind is very tense. The face is always the most difficult part. I always tell people, you can do a face, you can do anything. Because there's nothing, because with a face, you've got to, get, you've got to show emotion, you've got to show a presence of mind, uh, good feeling, bad feeling, you know, fear, or what have you. And that, 
to do that in a three-dimensional object is, is awfully difficult. By the early 1970s, Armand Lamontagne was beginning to focus most of his attention on portraits, still life paintings, and simple wood sculpting assignments. Among his inspired works from this period is one in which Armand takes very special pride. On the wall in his living room is an oil portrait of a beautiful young woman. It is Armand and Lorraine's daughter, Lisa. I say well, one of my most difficult sculptures, uh, I was married seven years before I had Lisa. No, we waited seven years. I didn't think I was going to have any children, so I finally gave up. After I hit 30, I said, well, I guess not. <laughs> and uh, that's when I got pregnant. So. I only have one daughter. It's never taken me that long to do any of my sculptures. It's certainly my proudest uh, sculpture to date, although I did have some help. I think my wife had uh, a lot to do with it. So together, I think we, we created a masterpiece. Well, Armin has one daughter, uh, Lisa. When we were neighbors out there, that was, uh, Lisa had just been born the same age as one of my children. I uh, certainly enjoyed seeing Lisa develop as a young woman and to this day, I mean, we're, I see Lisa frequently at various functions and uh, she certainly is a credit to Lorraine and Armin. It's nice to capture, I had the opportunity to uh, of course, she's always around, and, uh, and of course, my wife is always after me. We've got to do Lisa at this age because she's not going to stay this age, and, and, which is nice. It's nice. I got her at various ages and uh, did, did a number of sketches. Used her for my model in many paintings. Uh, Easter Sunday was, was a big painting I did. She's featured, uh, you know, prominently. I do like the, the portrait that he had done of me when I was about 22 months old called Serious Business. Of course, there's a story behind a lot of his work, and... Uh, you know, it tells the story of how I like to fill up the hole with the little, I guess it's the water decanter. I actually prefer the, uh, my 21st birthday portrait. Uh, I did sit a while for that, a few hours at the photographer's studio for that, and um, many different proofs came out of it, and I was able to pick the um, image that I wanted to portray in the portrait. Armand Lamontagne, the family man, was now becoming renowned for his still lifes and portrait work. Several major art exhibitions in the 1970s featured his uniquely focused two-dimensional sculptures. Every, all my still life looked like sculptures. It, it was a good point that I was not conscious of, and that I had wood in everything. Every one of my still lifes at that show had a piece of wood in it, in some form or other which means that I have an affinity with wood and objects and the dimensionality of objects. How I was very much concerned with, no matter on a two-dimensional plane, you're creating the third dimension. You're the magician. When it comes to painters, uh, the ones he talks about the most are Edward Hopper and Andrew Wyeth. He likes Hopper because of his minimalist approach to the canvas. And if you look at his paintings, La Montaigne tends to extract the extraneous to get to the essentials of the subject matter. The painting he did of me, he um, did in the late afternoon and the shadows were very deep and I complained to him afterwards that I had shadows under my eyes. <laughs> I said, you didn't have to put those in, but he did. He says, well, that's the way it was. That's the way the light fell, so that's why he put it, uh, shadows in. But the way I felt about it was that the tree was my husband's hand, and I was holding his hand. Will he be remembered as a painter more than a wood sculptor? To him, they are inseparable. He once told me that wood sculpture has made him a better painter because now he thinks three-dimensionally as he is painting two-dimensionally. And if you look at enough of his portraits, you will definitely see that. The stage was now set for Armin to take the leap of faith into his favorite realm and a whole other dimension. Sculpture is three dimensions. Painting is not. There's a big leap there, but it's all visual perception. Sculpture is reality. True sculpture is subtractive. It's a negative process. You've got to know where you're going, and you can't make mid-course maneuvers. You've got to be right on, and uh, perhaps that's the challenge. This statue is going to live longer than they will. This is for the ages. This is for posterity. And, and that's so important to know your subject, to know your better than anybody else. You've got to know your shit. 
in some ways he doesn't fit in because he's in a class by himself. Uh, you can't compare Armand to other wood carvers, wood sculptors, because there's nobody doing what he does. He prefers, and I agree, that he be called a wood sculptor. A carver suggests someone who is uh, working wood without artistry. Mm -hmm. But here Armand is really creating uh, portraits in wood. And uh, as I said before, nobody else is able to create a portrait in wood as he is able to. He has done the crucifix and his parish church. I have been in the church. It is absolutely out of this world. I use myself as a model only because I was 33 years old at the time. And that's the time that, according to the Bible, that's, he was 33 years old. They said roughly six feet. Well, I was a little over six feet. And they said, well, his father was a carpenter. Well, my father was a carpenter. And he used to walk to work. I said, I walked to work. And I said, you know, the parallels are crazy. Now, I was, I was telling this same story, just the way I'm telling you, to the priest. This is a joke, but I'm just a little bit of humor. And I said, well, that means that I have to pose for this crucifix. And I said, all I have to do is get a loincloth and walk around and get a mirror. And I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the crucifix. And I made, I did make it my exact size. So that crucifix is a self-portrait, except that I changed the face to, uh, you know, more of a Middle East looking individual. But I did that in record time. It's a big, robust Jesus, muscular and handsome and all. <laughs> so when I first saw it many, many years ago, I said to him, who posed for that? And he just, without batting an eye, said, who do you think? <laughs> I was starting to get known in the business and, and you know, in, in, in the, uh, certainly by other woodcarvers. And uh, I was buying tools from Woodcraft Supply for many years. When it came time to do their logo, they commissioned me to do it. Really my first big commission. Uh, I got a live model of Pose, who was not an Indian, was an all-state uh, football player for uh, Barville High School. He posed in a very difficult pose for a long time for me, which was very difficult. I'm still proud of the fact that it was a single piece of white pine it makes it awfully difficult because you have to dry it after it's carved, and that's not the easiest thing to do. I think an Indian could relate to the fact that there was no glue joints. It's pure, it's the way nature uh, grew the tree. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, the name Armand Lamontagne was becoming synonymous with large sculptures and portraits in wood. His early commissions gave him notoriety in his field of fine wood carving and at the same time opened the book to a new chapter in the history of American wood sculpture. Well, I was commissioned to do Patton, because Patton was obviously not living, and uh, so I had to deal with his son and daughter. When I met General George S. Patton, his son, at his home in Hamilton, he asked me whether, well, how come I want to do another sculpture of Patton? And I said, look, the movie Patton, I said, now everybody's going to think that he looks like George C. Scott. And I said, you don't want your father to be portrayed as George. He says, you're absolutely right. And I said, I want to do a portrait of, you know, what did your father really look like? The general liked that idea. And says, okay. I got to know a great deal about Pat because I had to do the research, I read the books, the biographies, and, and a fascinating individual. The drying of the, of the large single pieces of pine was really getting to be a logistical problem. And it was becoming more costly than actually buying the wood already kiln dry and having it laminated. And that's, so that, I think General Patton was the first time I used a laminated basswood block. Of course, I've been using them ever since. And there's a certain stability to kiln dry wood that you don't get with a, with a solid, uh, you know, fresh block. That was a big leap forward for me, that one sculpture, in every way, really. It, it was a very, it was a technical accomplishment as much as anything. I kind of like the pose, the arrogance, and that, that's what I was after. Well, that was 1982, and that was the week that he had uh, just finished up the General Patton, the statue of General Patton. I came into the studio and was talking to him, and I just couldn't get over the, the, the likeness of the statues. Most statues, if you went into a museum and you looked up, say, at a soldier, and he had a helmet on, it would stop right there. Well. I mean, being as uh, fussy as he is about everything that he does, he wanted them to be able to look up past the ears and past the helmet, which you could do. 
General Patton came up with his sister. They come into the studio, and the studio just had a dim light on. So when Armin opened the door, General Patton's daughter walked through the door first. She just broke down and started crying. You know, it's just like looking at your father coming alive. It was something that, that I was perhaps most pleased with when I got through. And as a sculptor, that's what concerns me, portraying the great heroes of my time, my contemporaries. I've often asked myself who Armand might identify with the most of the people he sculpted whom we might recognize. And I really think subconsciously it would be General George Patton, because I really see them as both warriors. Armand attacks wood and conquers it, very much as Patton conquered armies. Armand goes in and um, shows no mercy. So I was commissioned to Babe Ruth uh, uh, before Ted Williams for the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I had to get his, uh, I believe his 1927 uniform, kind of his peak year when he hit the 60 home runs and they were very nervous about having uh, leave the hall because the first time in almost 50 years that, that uniform had left. I dressed the model up, of course, to fit those dimensions. And it, it, it's really helpful. I'm, I'm really trying to capture the individual and what he looked like. It's a portrait of, of Babe Ruth, and I'm not so concerned with his athletic ability at this point, other than the fact that what did he look like if he was standing there? It's, it's almost a documentary process in three dimensions. Again, if you know your subject, it really helps. So I, I had everything but him. I had his uniform, I had models, but when I came to the face, I said, Jesus, I know I met his granddaughter, you know, but it's not the same. With the completion of the Babe Ruth sculpture, Armand was now ready to fully incorporate athletics and art into his life's work. The Babe Ruth sculpture would lead the lineup of sport legends and historical figures whose likenesses he would chip out of basswood, creating unique three-dimensional portraits of heroes frozen in time. I guess the Babe kind of introduced me to basically all my sports figures. Of course, when Mrs. Yockey saw Babe, the Babe Ruth statue that I had done a year before, uh, wanted to meet me. We, uh, I met her. We talked about it. She said, I'd like you to do Ted Williams. And I said, I'd love to do my, my hero. And she got a big kick out of that. And, and uh, that was the key thing for my getting a sculpture because she wanted to make amends and she wanted to make sure that her guy, Ted Williams, was there. But I guess the biggest to me was the, was the sculpting of Ted Williams. Because as a kid growing up, Williams was such a monumental figure here. And he was a very unique guy. And he was, he was the kind of surgeon about hitting that Armin is about his art and his craft. And therefore, I think there's a bond between Armin and Ted Williams. Well, the relationship between Armin and Ted Williams is a very interesting one because they are so similar in temperament even in the mannerisms and their tone of voice. I think there's something about people who are the best at what they do. Both men love to connect with their audience, people who appreciate what they've done. Well, I think, uh, first of all, Armin looked up to Ted Williams as an outstanding athlete. He looked up to him as a war hero, and he looked up to him because he always told the truth. And I think that's, I think Armin is somewhat like Ted in many ways. The similarities between Ted Williams and Armand Lamontagne is, is the effort they put in to get it, get the job done. That's the big similarities. I was, uh, I remember John Harrington calling me and said, you know, uh, if you're going to do the sculpture, you have to meet Ted and you have to get his input. And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, he said, you know, Ted's a little eccentric, but he said, don't worry about it. And uh, and I said, look. Uh, I'll take the chip off his shoulder. It's funny, Ted came around. Ted, it didn't take long for Ted to come around. And Armin tells stories about this, but I know that um, it probably took Ted about an, an hour, maybe less, to recognize that he was dealing with a kindred spirit and a kindred talent. Uh, I don't think it's um, going too far to say both men are geniuses. They're both outstanding in their own fields. I'm in an art and, and sculpture and Ted in, in baseball. And they just seem to hit it off together. You know, pretty good when Ted came up here first to see Armin. He says, I want to go and look at the sculptor first. 
to see if I like them, to see whether I'm going to let them sculpt me. When, Ted, when I first met Ted Williams, when he came here, when I was commissioned to do a sculpture, he says, he says, I understand you played ball. He says, yeah, do you have any pictures? And I couldn't think of any pictures I had, but I said, yes, I do. I said, in my Worcester Academy yearbook, there's a picture of my swing, just meeting the ball, my head's on the ball, and, and just as, as the bat meets the ball. Ted says, can I see that? So I, got, I went in and got it, and he says to me, you got a ruler? I said, yeah, I don't know what he was getting at. He took a rule and he put it down. He said, ah, damn it, you, you hit a ground ball, you were swinging down. And that's not the case. I got a triple. It was a line drive. And I, I, I didn't dare say that Ted, you know, I didn't want to tell Ted, Ted, you're wrong. Because, you know, I was trying to deal with him here. Anyway, uh, but I said, there's a case where Ted was wrong. Because I know what happened there. But uh, I got a big kick. But he says, your mechanics are great. Your eyes on the ball, blah, blah, blah. Hips before the hands. He went through the whole thing. He said, just tell me where you want me and I'll show up. July 26, 1985, at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, it was a day that both Armand Lamontagne and Ted Williams would not soon forget. I'm Ed Stack, president of the Baseball Hall of Fame here in Cooperstown. The Hall of Fame is very excited to have Hall of Famer Ted Williams here today to uh, unveil a new uh, wood statue, sculpted uh, statue, which has been sculpted by Armand, who was here with me, uh, to take part in the presentation. Ted wanted to be kind of surprised a little bit, and you know, he really was. However, I didn't think he'd be, I didn't think what took place would ever take place. Here we go, all set. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Not too high, Ted. Oh, I hope it don't hurt anything. When it was unveiled, Ted just kept looking at it, kept looking at it. Now there were cameras, TV cameras all over the place. And he knew he was going to have to make, give a speech, make a comment. And he kept looking at it and I'm saying, gee, he's not, I'd never seen him look this way. And it was kind of fidgety, it kind of choking up. And, and I said, Jesus, uh, to myself, you know, does he like it? Doesn't he like it? Finally, he, he started breaking up, and he broke down. Um, <laughs> this is a proud moment for me, and a happy one. When it was suggested that uh, a ton of laminated basswood lumber that was going to create this, help create it, start it. A friend of mine said, what a waste of wood. <laughs> uh, you might argue about the subject, but you can't argue about the work. <laughs> At that point, I was standing next to him and he put his arm on my shoulder and I, what a great relief that was. I was a little concerned at first, but you know, I didn't realize that he was, he was breaking up. Armand Lamontagne has done such a terrific job on this. I saw it three different times. I told Mrs. Yockey, I said, wait till you see it. I said, you're gonna love it. She says, the most important thing is that you love it. Yeah. And I do. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, I'm the only guy who took the chip off Ted Williams' shoulder. The Larry Bird sculpture is striking because it was the first time that Armand had a chance to work with a subject in the prime of his sporting career. Bird came about, obviously, from my reputation, from Dave Collins, who's the chairman of the uh, New England Sports Museum was familiar with my, my work at the Hall of Fame. He called me one day, said, like, to talk to me, came down, we had a nice long talk uh, here in the studio, and, and said, how would you like to do Larry Bird? And I said, would love it, one of my favorite guys. When I got Larry Bird here, I really enjoyed it because the real Larry was here, and I'm doing it at the same time, right at his peak. I remember the first time I uh, presented a slideshow of Larry Bird uh, in stages, showing how it progressed from this uh, enormous block of wood in a 
2,000 pounds of laminated basswood. I would tell the audiences that this was probably the finest thing that has ever been sculpted in wood. He has paid the ultimate uh, homage to these athletes by, with his own two hands, creating a work that is a permanent reminder of excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, Armand Lamontagne's Larry Bird. That was, I think, Armand's coming out to the sports public. Armin, thank you so much. Thank you and your family. You know, the only thing about Armin, it was all right from the head down to the waist, but when he started beating around with that chisel and hammer down there a little bit lower, I could feel it at night, so. <laughs> and it was an occasion. It, uh, there was a cover story on Bird and Sports Illustrated about a week after the unveiling that included the sculpture in the story. And pretty soon people started talking about Armin, so I think of the Larry Bird sculpture as Armin's, uh, his own unveiling, unveiling himself, not just the sculpture being unveiled, but he being unveiled to a very large audience. There is something about this Bird sculpture, poised for the free throw, that makes it just such a wonderful piece. Athletes will come in the sports museum, and uh, one in particular, uh, former Boston Celtic great and coach, Tom Heinsohn came in about a day after we had unveiled the bird sculpture. And he was showing it to some friends and he said, look at this, you know, but he said, of course he went and got sneakers and socks and he put them on the wood and um, I couldn't help but overhearing this and I said, excuse me, Mr. Heinsohn, the sneakers, everything you see is carved from one piece of, you know, one single block of laminated basswood. He said, I don't believe it. I said, we wouldn't allow anyone else to do this, but I said, step over the barrier and the proof is in the touch. You tell me. And he stepped over the barrier, he put his finger on that, and a doubting Thomas, of course, Heinsohn, just his jaw dropped. Someone who was not often speechless was, and as an artist himself, he's a painter, was very, uh, I think, humbled by the skill that it took to obviously to carve a sneaker that that fooled him. In fact, that fools, I'd say probably about half the audience that comes in to look at these works. They think those are Converse sneakers on his feet. Bobby, of course, came because I did the other guys. Uh, you know, I did Bird. There's only two great guys ever come out of from the Boston Garden, and Bobby Orr and Larry Bird. Those are the two guys. It's almost like a it has to happen, and it did. The Bobby Orr statue, again, not only is it a work that inspires awe when you look at it and you see the technical challenges that he faced, but, you know, just getting a hockey player to be made out of wood to stand on a block and the fact that he had to create steel skate blades that actually were housed into the base, all of these things that were engineering challenges as well as aesthetic challenges for him. I think the Bobby Orr sculpture, our life, did is outrageous. And when you look at that sculpture and you look at Bobby Orr, you think he's standing right there. As Armin, I've been around creative, talented people most of my life. And that gives me a great appreciation of what it is to be born with a gift. And let me tell you, I stand here in awe of your gifts. You are a master. You're an artist whose work shows more than just great skills. It shows a dedication, a commitment, and attention to the smallest detail, and a great pride. You're a pro, and I'm honored by the fact that through this statue, my name will be linked with yours for years to come, and I thank you so, so much. I'm kind of proud of that sculpture. It's a very, it was a very technically difficult sculpture. And I still look at the gloves and some of the, and some of the detail that I'm saying, gee, that's, uh, I did that, you know, that's, 
This is probably as close as I've come to uh, on certain parts of that sculpture, being pleased, really pleased with what I did. I once asked Armin what he tried to do with each new sculpture. And he said, well, I try and get better each time. I try and do something better. I try and do something new. And what the Karl Yastrzemski sculpture achieves is movement. He's gone from just taking wood and making it imitate other materials, but he's made the wood move. You can feel the breeze from the backswing of that swing of Karl Yastrzemski when you walk by that sculpture. The more I look at Yes, the more I say it's my best baseball sculpture. It's an action scene, it was a difficult scene, he stretched out, and yet it was a little different from, the, from my Babe Ruth or Ted Williams because he's animated, his face looks like he's in the middle of a swing. It wasn't just a pretty face or just a pretty picture, it was more of an animated face. And that, again, you never want to do the same thing I did, and Ted, you know, in the cock position, I wanted, I wanted somebody halfway through it, and it was a lot of tension, and that's what I like about that sculpture. He often compares his work to a race, and whom is he racing against? himself. He is constantly looking to get faster because he believes that if he gets faster he will get better and in fact he does. My wife says that he has a superiority complex. Um, if I'm not at home and he gets my answering machine he says this is God call me. Well I don't know too many gods and I always know that it's Armand leaving a message. Are there followers who will be doing this in the coming years? I find it hard to grasp that someone would be willing to devote that much time and effort to making full-size wood portrait sculptures in the future. Now, I may be proven wrong, but I think Armin will stand alone uh, even 100, 200 years from now. He certainly is a creative genius who is a treasure for everyone who has been privileged to touch his life. But more importantly, he's an inspiration for everybody who ever had a dream and dared to have the courage to make the dream happen. I say to Amon when there are photographers at an unveiling especially, I'd say, Amon, get, in, get into the picture. They're crying out loud, get into the picture. I said, well, you know, you know, an artist doesn't compete with his work. He, uh, I said, get into the picture. And he usually does. Folks, say hello to On Deck.